Bonjour à toutes et à tous. Good afternoon, good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, je suis Alice Panier, responsable du programme géopolitique de l'IFRI, qui organise cette conférence. I'm Alice Panier, head of the Geopolitics of Technology program that's organizing uh, this conference. Uh, I'm going to start my introduction in English especially who are um, watching uh, online, to let you know that uh, there is a tr uh, live translation. Uh, and so you can switch channels from English to French on Zoom. Pour les personnes dans la salle, vous avez uh, des casques de traduction disponibles si vous souhaitez suivre la conférence en français. La conférence se, se tiendra principalement en anglais. Uh, et vous pouvez uh, voilà, aussi uh, switcher entre les langues. Uh, pour ceux qui sont en présentiel, il y a un QR code à l'entrée de la salle avec le programme et les biographies des participants uh, que vous pouvez télécharger sur votre téléphone. So, I'm going to switch back to English. Uh, this afternoon, we are hosting this uh, conference with a stellar set of uh, AI experts. Uh, AI experts from the US, from the UK, from Germany, from India, and obviously from France as well, to deal with um, international issues uh, around AI. Um, beyond uh, the hype of ChatGPT, there are uh, long-standing geopolitical challenges uh, raised by these uh, new sets of technologies, as well as obvious uh, governance and regulation uh, issues that have to be tackled to the extent possible on an international level. So we are going to, um, to address all of these uh, issues this afternoon. Uh, there will be a Q&A uh, Q uh, box uh, on the Zoom. You can feel free for those who are on Zoom to uh, write down your questions uh, throughout the conference. Please uh, make sure you mention your affiliations. Et pour les personnes dans la salle, nous ferons uh, évidemment uh, uh, un Q&A uh, en live avec vous dans la salle également. Uh, vous pourrez vous manifester pour uh, poser vos questions. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to let uh, give the floor to the first uh, panel uh, that's going to be moderated by our very own uh, Mathilde Vellier to deal with the geopolitics uh, of AI and technological competition and what's at stake for um, France and Europe uh, amidst um, US-China uh, tech rivalry. Uh, so, Mathilde, the floor is yours, and uh, good afternoon to all. Merci beaucoup. Um, thank you very much, and uh, welcome to all of you, both um, in person and online. Um, I'm very excited to, to start this first discussion, um, which, as you know, will focus on the geopolitical rivalry um, and the global competition in, in AI. Um, so obviously the, the center of the discussion when, um, when we talk about the global competition in AI is um, the, the competition between the United States and China. Um, and I think it's not just because they, they're the only ones making the, the, the general important progress in AI, because obviously there are other powers like Europe, Japan, um, in addition to the US and China making great progress, uh, generally speaking, in AI. In AI but um, because they largely lead the way in terms of commercial and national security adoption uh, in AI, and also because their geopolitical rivalry um, emerges as a determining factor in, in the so-called AI race. So uh, both countries have stated that AI, as you know, um, is one of their top priority, and they have deployed policies and investments uh, to outrun the other with uh, also impacts for other powers in the world. And um, I'm really hoping we're going to be able to tackle all this um, in, in this first discussion. Um, to tackle all these issues, I'm, we're very lucky to welcome uh, three fantastic and very knowledgeable guests. Uh, Gregory Allen um, online from CSIS, um, Rebecca Orchesati um, from Merix, and Séverine Arsène from the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So I think that without further ado, we'll start with the um, American perspective, um, thanks to uh, Gregory Allen. Um, Gregory Allen is the director of the Wadwani Center for AI and Advanced Technologies um, at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, CSIS. Um, prior to joining CSIS, he was the director of strategy and policy at the Department of Defense Joint Artificial Center, where he oversaw development and implementation of the DOD's AI strategy. Um, and his um, expertise and professional experience is quite broad, spanning uh, AI, robotics, um, semiconductors, 
space technology and national security. Uh, and I think that uh, obviously we are, um, we are very much going to be able to hear the American views from you as you recently, I think just two weeks ago, welcomed um, the Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer to discuss his, his views on, uh, on his new initiative on, on AI. Um, so without further ado, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for being with us. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to be with you here today. And thank you for uh, those kind introductory remarks. Um, so I used to be in the United States government, but my sort of principal background prior to that was actually in corporate uh, technology strategy. Um, and so these issues uh, used to be primarily commercial issues, and then suddenly they are national security and geopolitical issues in a really significant way. And I think that is unlikely to change anytime soon. Uh, to just give you one bit of uh, context and one data point that I find to be quite remarkable, uh, President Joe Biden here in the United States uh, recently disclosed that he has roughly three meetings per week on artificial intelligence. And I will tell you that not many things make it onto Joe Biden's calendar three times per week. Uh, and artificial intelligence is now at that stage where it sort of demands the attention of the world's leaders. The basic reason is that leadership in the United States, in China and elsewhere, believe that leadership in artificial intelligence technology is foundational to the future of economic and military power. And they are competing mightily uh, to ensure that they have that leadership position. Um, and as you just heard, it's not that other countries are not present or strong in AI. Europe has a very, very strong AI research ecosystem, for example. Uh, Japan is also notably strong in AI research. But where the United States and China stand out is that they are not only strong in AI research, but also very strong in the commercial adoption and in the national security uses of artificial intelligence. So I'll start uh, just by talking a bit about how I see the uses of AI technology as a national security technology, um, and then talk about my sense of the current geopolitical landscape. So to begin, um, artificial intelligence is a general purpose technology. It is not one thing, it is an extremely broad category of things. So when you think about artificial intelligence, a very helpful analogy uh, is computer software, just traditional computer software. Uh, in the national security establishment, computer software is used to type out documents and to facilitate the transfer of emails. And it's also used to command missile guidance systems or missile defense networks. Computer software is used in absolutely everything. And today, I would say artificial intelligence's use in uh, military technology is confined to sort of a handful of niches. But over the coming decades, I expect that artificial intelligence will increasingly be used uh, in just about every aspect of military and intelligence technologies. Um, here are just a few illustrative examples that I find to be quite compelling. Um, so it's, it's not effortless to talk about the military uses because many of them are classified. So it's often easier to talk about commercial companies. Um, one commercial company that's notable is Maxar. They are a satellite reconnaissance firm, first and foremost. If you've seen you know, pictures of the war in Ukraine that were taken by satellite, there is a good chance that those pictures you know, in your newspaper uh, were taken by Maxar. And they have a fleet of Earth imaging satellites that take so many pictures every single day uh, that in my recent conversation with their chief technology officer, he said that for a human analyst to analyze all of the pictures that come off of Maxar's reconnaissance satellite network, it would be 85 years of work per day. That's how much imagery they collect. It's far more imagery than humans could plausibly keep up with. And so one solution to this problem would be to hire vastly more workers, vastly more imagery analysts. But Maxar is a business and they are trying to be a profitable business. Um, and that kind of you know, workforce 
would be cost prohibitive. So what they do instead is they have uh, computer vision machine learning, you know, a subcategory of artificial intelligence, do a first pass through all the images that come off of their satellites. And what that can do is it cannot say, you know, the AI is not so sophisticated that can, it, it can look at all of the pictures and say, for example, Russia is planning to invade Ukraine. There's not that level of sophistication in the AI yet. Uh, but what it can say is all of these pictures are of empty ocean. And in these pictures, there are warships. Or it can say, you know, this airfield was empty yesterday. And today there are a lot of bomber aircraft today. And what that does is it can sort of provide a recommendation and prioritization system for the use of the human analyst. The AI can say, of all of the pictures that our satellite network took today, these are the ones that I recommend uh, that human analysts look at first and prioritize first. And the results of that approach are a dramatic expansion of the human analyst productivity and a dramatic expansion of the timeliness with which Maxar can go through its enormous data set and make that actionable information for its customers, which are intelligence organizations and financial trading firms you know, around the world. Well, I gave you just one example of satellite reconnaissance, but that same story is playing out in intercepted voice communications, uh, which now can be immediately transcribed and made into a searchable text database you know, instead of thousands of days worth of audio collected per day that some human has to listen to and transcribe and then get to the right human analyst. Um, there's also, you know, non-intelligence uh, applications of AI, uh, such as predictive maintenance, trying to understand which parts on an aircraft or a tank or a ship um, are likely to malfunction first and to uh, do preventative maintenance rather than just doing so based on a calendar, you can actually do it based on sensor data you know, from these systems backed by machine learning and historical data from those parts. So in all of these you know, applications, these are you know, select niches where AI is already proving its use. But if you recall, you know, in World War II, computers did not have that many uses. It was cracking codes with the Enigma machine. It was calculating artillery trajectories. And um, it was you know, uh, optimizing the use of aircraft autopilots, uh, which were quite nascent at the time. Computers were not an incredibly diverse and widespread you know, use technology. But over the coming decades, they became that. And I think the leadership of the United States national security community uh, and the Chinese national security community are both absolutely convinced uh, that leadership in artificial intelligence will be as significant in the coming decades as leadership in uh, computers was for the United States during the Cold War. The second thing that I would say is that artificial intelligence technology you know, has geopolitical dimensions um, but they are not always, you know, uh, helpfully understood by the most commonly used analogies. Uh, so, for example, the difference between machine learning software and traditional software is that whereas in traditional software, every line of computer code is typed out by human hands, in the case of machine learning, you are exposing a machine learning algorithm to a training data set and you are thereby producing an AI model that has sort of programmed itself based on what it has learned from that data set. Um, now, from that, you can infer that training data is incredibly strategically important. Uh, and I often hear in conversations that, you know, China is the Saudi Arabia of data. But one thing that's quite important to understand here is that for machine learning systems, you know, training data is application specific. You cannot use the data from a bunch of Chinese social media apps to train a missile guidance system. You need missile guidance data for that. And uh, right now, you know, China's most widespread use of artificial intelligence is for domestic surveillance and repression. Um, 
they have set up an extremely sophisticated uh, state surveillance apparatus hooked into their censorship network as well. And it's really for domestic population control. Um, but I would say while the Chinese military is not as far along as the domestic surveillance community, they are quite far along and they are certainly no less ambitious. So the next element of the, the geopolitical dimensions of this are not about the data, but about the computing hardware upon which all AI algorithms rely. And so all AI software has to run on semiconductor computer chip hardware somewhere. You know, whether that's a local on-premise data center or a data center based in the cloud. And just compare, compared to traditional software, uh, machine learning software tends to be extremely uh, computationally intensive. And you want sort of specialized uh, computer chips that are optimized for these applications. So this is where the October 7th uh, export controls uh, which were a real landmark in history last year, uh, come in. I often say that two dates from 2022 are likely to echo in geopolitical history. February 24th, when Russia invaded Ukraine, and October 7th, when the United States imposed new export controls on advanced uh, AI and semiconductor technologies to China. So in one sense, these export controls were extremely narrowly targeted. They affect you know, around 1% of the overall global semiconductor market. Um, and it, only a fraction, you know, of all the chips that are going to China. But they are the chips that are optimized for training large AI algorithms. Um, and these are chips that uh, in the Department of Defense, I knew uh, for a fact, you know, were being used by the Chinese military to train their advanced AI algorithms. Um, I'm, I'm even aware of individual weapon systems uh, in China that you know were purchasing uh, U.S. computer chip hardware and incorporating them into military systems. And this is not merely you know based on um, the assessments of the United States intelligence community. Uh, a think tank here in Washington actually did the work of identifying Chinese procurement records available openly on the internet where Chinese military organizations are saying, we are looking for US AI semiconductors and we're using them for these military applications. Um, so the United States has sort of decided that their previous policy of facilitating commercial trade in semiconductors and AI with China, um, while restricting you know, military end uses and military end users uh, was no longer viable. Uh, China's policy of civil military fusion uh, was simply too effective, and the linkages between China's commercial te tech sector and their military tech sector are now so deeply intertwined uh, that there is no credible path to uh, restrict one while facilitating the other. And so these export controls notably apply to China as an entire country, uh, not to the end uses exclusively for the military, which had been the preceding US policy for decades. Well, these, these export controls did not come out of nowhere. Uh, it took a long time for the United States uh, to get to this point, um, but it was sort of an assessment of the reality of China's objectives in the international community, and particularly with regards to military AI modernization, and a commitment that the United States uh, did not want to be selling, you know, what ultimately can be used as weapons uh, in a fight potentially against the United States or its allies. Um, and so this was a, a landmark policy, but one that I think was sort of well-founded uh, in the reality of the situation, as difficult uh, as that reality may be. Um, one final thing I'll say is that those export controls did not only apply to the chips themselves, um, but also to the software that is used to design those chips, to the machines that are used to make those chips, um, and even to the expertise uh, that is used to build the machines that build those chips. Um, and the reason for that is that these export controls are designed to work. Um, you know, the United States puts export controls out there that it sometimes knows will have no meaningful effect other than diplomatic signaling. Uh, for example, 
you know, when the dictator of Syria, you know, Bashar al-Assad was engaged in a brutal, repressive civil war, you know, the United States banned the export of handcuffs to Syria. But we did not believe that this was going to make a meaningful difference, you know, in the Syrian regime's ability to acquire handcuffs. We merely wanted to send a signal. Um, the reason why these export controls are so extensive uh, is that they are designed to work. And that is why there is this sort of broad interlocking mechanism of controls around AI chips, AI chip making software, and AI chip making machines, uh, because that is simply what it takes to have the intended outcome. Uh, and the United States here welcomes uh, the, the collaboration um, of other countries in updating their own export controls to sort of take into account uh, the new geopolitical reality that we find ourselves in. Um, I'll stop there and I look forward to the comments of the other speakers. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, this very interesting presentation and enlightening examples. Um, I maybe have just a quick follow-up question before um, giving the floor to the other speakers on the um, the impact that the restrictions that you mentioned, the October 7th restriction you mentioned, will have on Chinese um, military, but also generally speaking, AI capabilities, um, both regarding the restrictions that are already in place uh, that were imposed, as you mentioned, last October, but also um, how you envision the impact of the future restrictions that are um, seemingly imminent, uh, both on cloud services, on other types of chips, uh, particularly those produced by NVIDIA, and also uh, on other maybe more innovative elements um, like on outbound, invest sorry, outbound investments. Um, since I know that you're also an expert on, on Chinese capabilities, I'd be very curious to hear your, your views on this. Um, well, first, you know, uh, you, you use the word imminent to describe uh, <laughs> for several export months. controls. Um, the outbound, investi in outbound investment restrictions have been imminent for about a year now. Um, so the, you know, the media's track record in predicting, you know, when uh, these new developments are going to come to pass uh, has not exactly been stellar in this area. Uh, but I will say the, the impact is extremely significant. Um, you know, there are Chinese chip making companies and Chinese chip design companies, I think, for example, of, you know, Byron, uh, which, you know, is China's most sophisticated designer of AI chips. Um, they've been set back years, perhaps decades uh, in this area. And um, the thing about computer chips, you know, is that they are relatively lightweight, uh, relatively small, um, and they're working, they're worth a lot of money. Uh, and smugglers love all of those attributes, right, in a product. Uh, but I think the difference between, um, uh, you know, this circumstance and the other circumstances is that one, you know, the chip machines are enormous and require a lot of post-sales support. So the machines that you use to make semiconductors are significantly easier to export control and to enforce those export controls, you know, than other categories. And that is, you know, having the intended impact on China's semiconductor ecosystem. Then with respect to the, the chips themselves, um, you know, smugglers are hardworking and usually intelligent people. Um, and so it's really hard to defeat them. But I would say that, you know, the evidence of smuggling that we've seen for, you know, advanced AI semiconductors, you know, is in single digit quantities of products. You know, these chips are like 70,000 chips a piece. And if you want to build the type of infrastructure that would be used to train something like ChatGPT, you need tens of thousands of these chips. And the number of companies who could credibly oversee a project to build that type of system is a really short list in China. Um, and so while I think, you know, uh, the idea that, you know, no AI chip will ever get to China, you know, above the performance thresholds that are specified in the regulations, I think that's a farce. Um, however, I do think the, you know, intended impact of materially degrading the ability of the Chinese military to harness these advanced AI systems, I believe that is having an intended impact. 
Thank you. Um, I could talk about US export controls all day, but I would not impose this on our audience. And I'm, I'm also very excited to hear um, uh, a little bit more uh, on, on the Chinese view from our two experts. Um, I'll turn maybe to um, to you, Rebecca, on uh, to, to hear a little bit more on the Chinese um, AI ecosystems and policies, um, and also its approach to AI governance and its use for, for surveillance that was mentioned by, by Gregory. Um, so Rebecca is a lead analyst at the Mercator Institute for China Studies, uh, MIRIX, and her research focuses on China's technology and digital policy, as well as Europe-China innovation relations that I think you'll mention too, um, I hope so. She covers the global footprint of Chinese tech firms, digital infrastructure and surveillance tools, governance of data and artificial intelligence, technology transfer and research collaboration, and um, she has studied and worked in Beijing, Shanghai, Dalian, I think now currently based in Berlin. Um, wonderful. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mathilde. And thank you so much to uh, IFRI colleagues for, for having me, for inviting me. Uh, thank you also uh, to Gregory for the excellent remarks. I always learn a lot from your technical um, explanations, also a strategic piece uh, and how you summarize that. Um, so I, I just returned from a, uh, an academic conference in Germany uh, where for three days, uh, some of the leading scholars working on um, digital surveillance came together to discuss um, China and how um, AI amongst other technologies are, are being used for uh, domestic repression, which is um, a piece that uh, Gregory just, just touched on. Um, and, and a lot of my time I, I spent thinking about the uh, digital rights and the human rights implications of that. But I'll, I'll, I'll pause for a moment and I'll put this aside um, to focus on a, a few other aspects, which I find quite important now for um, European stakeholders to um, understand when it comes to um, AI in China, uh, the ecosystem, the strategy and, and, and the policies of AI in China. Um, I, I'll start with a couple of, of, of questions and then maybe I'll return to those later. Um, one big question which I think now European policymakers are facing is that there's at least one other jurisdiction, which is China, um, that has come up with pretty ambitious efforts to govern and regulate AI. Um, and to me, a big and quite unresolved question is how are we going uh, to exchange and collaborate um, on, on pretty existential questions related to AI ethics and safety with a jurisdiction that doesn't share um, our, our values. Um, and I think this is um, for uh, European lawmakers and, and policymakers a, a, a very important question. Um, another question which we're trying to address in, in um, a, a project I'm, I'm leading at Merix at the moment is how entangled are Europe and China in AI? And I really appreciated Gregor's comment about you know, the strength of the European research ecosystem. And that's the strength that um, many Chinese actors have definitely also um, identified. At, and the collaboration that's taking place at the level of basic research between the, the European and the Chinese AI communities is fascinating and is, in my view, a, an underexplored um, dimension. Um, we, we focus a lot on US-China competition and, and to some extent maybe more in the past collaboration in AI, but let's not forget that Europe is also a player here and that uh, there's a lot of there are a lot of entanglements and ties with with the Chinese ecosystem as well. But I'll I'll say a few words just to make some high level observations about um, the Chinese ecosystem and, and policies and where I think um, um, they stand. Um, the first thing I want to say is that um, echoing also what Greg already mentioned, uh, Beijing really has prioritized um, AI as a strategic technology. It views AI as a technology that can tremendously boost national competitiveness and, and, and security. Um, it views AI, and particularly, um, I'm talking about Xi Jinping's leadership, views AI as a uh, really a chance to leapfrog and surpass an advanced industrialized economy, primarily the US, in military terms and in economic terms. 
Uh, the idea being that for a number of technologies in the past, China lagged behind, was heavily reliant on, on foreign inputs, but AI as, as a new technology where China does have some advantages um, offers a tremendous opportunity to, to really catch up and, and, and surpass. Um, this is quite um, evident as a policy objective if you look back at the um, artificial in, um, intelligent innovation plan, the um, uh, development plan that was issued in 2017, which is the main policy document that really spells out Chinese ambitions uh, in this area. This idea of being the world's leading AI innovation powerhouse by 2030. Uh, and that really sent signals across throughout the Chinese innovation ecosystem. Uh, really clear um, guidelines were set at the center and then um, as policymaking and implementation work in China, local governments and, and different actors within the Chinese innovation system then proceeded with implementation. This really sent local governments into a frenzy. Um, we saw um, huge funding for um, AI startups in China, and this really helped, this government support really helped, in my view, uh, the sector um, uh, rise tremendously over the past few years. Um, obviously, we saw this in the form of uh, financial support um, for both basic research and commercialization. Um, the buildup of China's talent base. This is another big preoccupation for Chinese leaders, how to make sure we have enough workforce, um, top, um, top uh, AI talent that's able to, um, to support us in our, um, in our goals. Um, another interesting piece is infrastructural support. Uh, just one example of that is um, the National Computing Power Network that, that uh, the Chinese government is working on. This idea that uh, because AI will require more and more computing power um, and because that needs to be distributed efficiently, um, also with a view uh, to um, make all that you know, infrastructure um, environmentally sustainable, uh, there needs to be some coordination at the national level. So they are really undertaking what, what I consider a pretty ambitious effort to, to redesign the entire um, uh, data market uh, nationally, the uh, data center infrastructure, computing power using supercomputers to try to allocate uh, better and more efficiently uh, that computing power that they have. Um, obviously, and um, Gregory can, can probably add a lot to that, the Chinese military has also um, prioritized AI greatly with the idea that um, the future of warfare will be um, uh, intelligentized, um, that um, AI will radically transform um, warfare in all ways. And we are not just talking about, you know, conventional warfare. We're also talking about um, the cyber piece. We're talking about cognitive warfare. Um, and there, uh, I think we're seeing interesting experiments um, uh, in different uh, defense universities in China to undertake relevant research to, for example, harness machine learning for information operations, for, for cyber attacks. Um, and that is another space which I think um, um, liberal democracies really um, should be watching uh, very closely. Second observation is uh, about the strengths uh, of the Chinese ecosystem and the results that it's achieved so far. Um, research by, by CSET, the Center for Strategic and Emerging Technology found, uh, so they looked at the top cited AI papers and, and found that the top 1% of most cited AI papers um, come from, from China. Uh, this is mainly in the computer vision space. Um, so China has, you know, a mass tremendous advantage in the computer vision space. Um, they are not as advanced in other fields. Um, they're less advanced, for example, compared to the U.S. in um, natural, langu natural language processing. Uh, but still, um, um, it's, it's quite relevant um, and also quite uh, quite connected to what I was saying earlier and what Gregory also mentioned, which is the focus on domestic surveillance. Computer vision is, you know, the key AI field um, for, for those applications. Um, China has also made, I think, some interesting uh, advances when it comes to AI chips, and we can maybe return to that in, in the discussion. 
Um, and there's this vibrant um, AI ecosystem. Some of the leading firms globally uh, in AI nowadays are, are, are Chinese. Uh, when I talk to um, European companies, European tech firms that are conducting R&D in China, I'm hearing that a lot of them are more and more interested in that ecosystem, uh, both as an investment opportunity and also um, as a um, as a, a, an area of experimentation, a lot of talent there, um, and and I think um, it's quite interesting to see that European companies are, are seeing more and more opportunities um, there. Um, that said, uh, and this is the third point I want to make: China also has major weaknesses when it comes to AI. Um, and I think, um, you know, I like the oil data analogy because I think it's, it's the usual um, trope that sometimes we hear about that, you know, because China has a lot of data, uh, they will overtake um, the US in AI. Well, it, it's not so simple. Um, and I think one interesting example is uh, large language models. I mean, we've seen around 79, I believe, um, experiments or pilots of, of large language models in, in the Chinese context, but when it comes to performance thresholds, they're not, they're nowhere close to where OpenAI uh, is with ChatGPT. So there's still quite a big gap there, and I think this is quite important to emphasize. Um, I will also say that uh, Chinese tech companies now are. Um, caught between a rock and a hard place um, in a way, uh, on the one hand, uh, because government regulations are becoming a bit more restrictive, and I'll return to that, um, but especially when it comes to generative AI, um, I, I struggle to see how uh, um, you know this, these regulations, if they, they won't be uh, adjusted, will um, you know, enable um, innovation going forward. I think they might actually slow down um, uh, the, the rate of innovation in, in China's AI industry. On the other side, you have the US restrictions, um, which came last October uh, and which were just discussed by, by Gregor. Um, we hear, um, I'd be curious to hear your view, Gregor, if, Gregory, if, if this is coming or not, but we're hearing that the Biden administration is considering to even extend um, those controls covering the chipsets that NVIDIA basically created to um, adjust to the to the new controls. So the chips with a lower performance uh, threshold, which could be, um, well, for now, they, they can be shipped to China and would allow uh, the Chinese tech industry um, to still train their AI models. That will be more costly and it will take place more slowly, uh, but those chips would be good enough. Um, the question, of course, is what happens if the US decides to, to close some of the gaps that remain, uh, working on you know, uh, restricting access to those chips as well, um, there are discussions now about closing the gap when it comes to Chinese tech firms' access to NVIDIA chips via um, cloud service providers, which I think could have a very big impact on the industry. Um, there are also weaknesses when it comes to foundational models. Um, I mean, the foundational um, open source um, machine learning frameworks China relies on are, are American. Um, Chinese companies have come up, I think, with, with quite some interesting experiments. Uh, Baidu, Alibaba's Damo Academy and others, um, I think they're, they're doing quite interesting work um, on, on foundational um, software and, and models, but again, uh, still lagging behind, I think, the, uh, the quality of, of what you have um, in, uh, in um, the US. Um, the other point I want to make is that um, China's industry is obviously deeply connected with the rest of the world. And we, we saw that uh, with uh, you know, the aftermath of the October controls and, and the impact that those can have on the industry. Um, US technology in particular, uh, not only from the US, but, but definitely the US is, is a, played a big role, but also training and knowledge were really instrumental uh, in enabling the Chinese AI industry to grow. I mean, Microsoft's uh, famous AI lab in China really was instrumental uh, to that. Um, um, 
U.S. educated talent was also very important in uh, you know developing the Chinese AI industry. Returnees who studied in China, in, sorry, in the U.S. and then went back to China and and uh, really um, produced some 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 great breakthroughs. Um, AI is also a field that relies heavily on the open source model. Uh, it's you know communities from different countries coming together. Um, and building on each other's um, uh, innovation um, and, um, and and models, and and this is to say that it's very difficult um, in a at a moment when we talk so much about an AI race and and the geopolitical aspect to talk about such a thing as Chinese AI or US AI. It really is a global industry, and, and this also complicates, I think. Um, efforts to disentangle um, innovation ecosystem um, in in different countries. Um, on um, on this point, um, I want to say a few words about sort of how Europe and China are are, are intertwined uh, in in AI. We just looked at um, a, a corpus of of papers, English language papers, published between 2017 and 2022, with co-authors from Europe and 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 China. Uh, it's a fascinating data set, which I think tells us a lot about um, about the patterns of collaboration between these two uh, regions. Uh, some 37,000 papers published over that period. Um, the UK obviously is um, the leading partner for China in, in Europe. It's actually the second largest research partner for China in AI research around the world. Uh, the second most relevant partner in Europe is, is Germany. A lot of collaboration also taking place uh, there. Um, interestingly, I think we're also seeing more um, investment by European companies into the Chinese startup ecosystem. Uh, it's nowhere close to the volumes that we see from, from uh, US investors, but still, um, I think interesting to see that that interest from Euro European investors is, is picking up. Um, Huawei has chosen Europe as it, basically its most important um, AI R&D hub outside China, in addition to Canada. Um, doing very interesting work. Um, not many people talk about it in Zurich, for example. Um, they're really actively researching um, AI chips, uh, doing, doing quite relevant work there. Um, and this is an area where Huawei is trying to, to, to catch up, also to mitigate the, the effects of, of US um, export controls. Um, and obviously, we also see from that data set that um, collaboration isn't all black or white. We see, um, unfortunately, um, that European uh, partners uh, with Chinese colleagues are working on pretty clearly uh, military focused um, applications um, of AI research, um, target tracking research. Um, we see uh, collaborations that focus on uh, biometric recognition. Um, and of course, these are quite problematic, especially considering that the Chinese partners on the other side are often um, universities which are directly controlled uh, by, by the, the People's Liberation Army or at least maintain close ties with the PLA. Uh, so this is happening, and I think this is something that um, um, policymakers um, haven't, haven't um, really um, tackled um, yet. Um, obviously, at the same time, we also see a lot of beneficial research. Um, we see a ton of uh, medical AI research being done between European and, and, and Chinese partners. And, and this is to say that decoupling um, is, is easier said than done. Uh, you can obviously um, target uh, hardware and also some, um, some software, as, as Gregory explained, with export controls as an instrument. But it is very difficult to, to stop the cross-border um, innovation that's taking place in AI. And, and maybe a question is also whether it would even be in, in Europe's interest um, to, uh, to do so. One um, very final word about, um, about uh, governance, the governance piece in, in China. Um, Chinese actors are really paying close attention to, to um, AI harms, to social harms, 
both near-term um, um, societal consequences like privacy violations, but also longer-term like existential risks. Um, China is, I think, ahead um, compared to many other jurisdictions, um, including, um, I think, at the moment, the United States in regulating AI, um, deep fakes, recommender systems, um, and, and, um, and so on. Um, they're also actively looking at the European, um, at the EU AI Act as a model, uh, which I think is an interesting um, um, case of cross-border learning in, in AI governance. Um, obviously, uh, the question is um, how um, this effort to regulate AI will coexist with um, other efforts. Um, for example, the Chinese police is focused on harnessing AI for um, um, for population control, using AI for ethnicity detection, um, as spotting um, Uyghur uh, faces, for example, more, more easily and accurately in a crowd, which is obviously incompatible with uh, liberal democratic values uh, that, that the European Union is instead uh, proposing. So there's a contradiction here, uh, where on the one hand, I think they are doing work that um, is um, conducive to greater um, 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 to ethical concerns being be, being being addressed. But on the other hand, um, they are obviously engaging, um, the, the Chinese Communist Party is engaging in practices which are um, quite, um, quite concerning. Um, I will also say, um, and I'll conclude here, um, for Chinese companies, it's become more and more difficult to um, say no. Um, to the party state. Um, the Chinese AI industry, in particular, their, the computer vision industry, has developed in many ways a symbiotic relationship with public security authorities. They rely on, on public-private partnerships. They rely on police contracts. And that begs the question how the industry going forward will, will be able to, um, to really implement ethical AI when the incentives for doing so uh, in the Chinese system um, are simply not there. Uh, there are opposite incentives and state security priorities really set the tone for what um, AI R&D in China uh, is, supposed to, is supposed to produce. Um, this is another big concern, which I think um, uh, will make it more difficult for Europe to, to engage. Uh, there needs to be engagement, I think, but it will be difficult to make it work in a way that um, is compatible with, with our value system. Um, I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for, for your remarks. I think it really helps us um, go beyond the, the, the infamous, infamous question of uh, who is winning the AI race between the US and, and China by really shedding light on the strengths and weaknesses of, uh, um, of China in each sub-segment and also emphasizing the international cross-border dimension of research, investments, and, uh, and even um, attempts its governance, as, as you mentioned. So thank you, thank you very much. Um, and I think that now for our uh, last expert, we'll, we'll maybe open a little bit the discussion and, and bring it closer to home um, with the, um, Dr. Severine Arsène, uh, who is Asia Advisor at the Center for Analysis, Planning and Strategy, uh, Le CAPS, en bon français, uh, in the French Ministry for Europe and Foreign Affairs. Um, so you have a background in political science and uh, you're a China scholar. You published um, extensively on Chinese cyber policy, notably as a researcher at the Center for Research on Contemporary China in Hong Kong, um, as well as um, as the editor-in-chief of China Perspectives. Um, and you held uh, numerous teaching and research positions um, uh, among other uh, places at the Chinese University of Hong Kong, the University of Lille, um, the Orange Labs in uh, Paris and Beijing, um, and you have a PhD uh, from Sciences Po. Um, so I'll give you the floor for your remarks, um, I think maybe also on the, the impact of this uh, US-China rivalry uh, on French and European actors. Thank you, Mathilde. And thanks very much for the invitation. It's great to be here uh, with um, both excellent panelists. I have to clarify that even though my day job is at the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs, indeed, um, I guess uh, my lens into the subject is uh, more 
stemming from the years I've passed uh, researching and teaching on that subject as a researcher in various organizations and even currently as an associated researcher at the Media Lab at Sciences Po. Um, so I'll try, uh, so much has been said already, I'll try my best to not uh, overlap too much. Um, I want to address quickly that kind of a landscape that is um, drawn by the US-China competition, but then um, to spend more time in uh, asking what that means for Europe and what that might mean for uh, Europe in relationship with those third countries in other regions in the world. Um, first, um, one of the aspects that strikes me a lot um, is how much China and the US actually share common points, even though they have very different political regimes, obviously, and uh, they uh, don't necessarily use uh, AI for the same and uh, types of applications uh, and uses, but it's still striking how much technology and AI, among other technologies, are central pieces of the social polit and political contracts of those two countries. Um, for the modern modernization of the state and industry, for the modernization of the state society relationship, through digital economy, through uh, better public services, for example, and in some cases, like the Chinese case, uh, through digitally enabled surveillance, but then um, in contrast in the US, uh, through a model of economic growth that has sometimes been associated with uh, advocacy for low uh, regulation, for instance. So we, we do have cont contrasts between these two models, but both put technology at uh, a very high level of priority in their policies because so much of their social contract relies on it. Uh, both also have complicated relationships between private corporations and the state because that's an industry that's very uh, intensive uh, in intellectual capital, in human labor, high skilled and low skilled when it comes to inputting some data. Uh, it's intense, intensive in the exploitation of the user's data as well. Um, and in all of that, private corporations uh, have historically played a central role. And that's also a common point between these two countries that they have to deal with the very central space that uh, the private sector is occupying in how to um, uh, regulate it, how to manage the question of monopolies, for example, how, and of course, they make then different choices in, the, in how to uh, arbitrate on those different issues. Also, those two countries share uh, the fact that domestic politics influence their international posture uh, with quite patriotic and nationalistic um, viewpoints inside the country and some of their decisions on AI and on technology actually stem from those domestic constraints. Um, and that might sometimes explain the radicality of some of the tit-for-tat measures that we are seeing in terms of export controls. Um, so that's also part of the sort of a background, political background that we're seeing um, in, uh, in those countries. And that impacts quite a lot how the uh, US-China competition impacts the rest of the world. So um, we're starting, we're coming from a, a landscape where uh, US platforms uh, were quite ubiquitous and as a result US regulations and the platform's code of conduct would have an extraterritorial effect and apply to much of the world. And for example, in the Philippines today, Facebook is the main access point to the internet, the main source of information for a lot of people. Uh, which means um, AI-based automated content control affects how information can circulate uh, online worldwide. The same, in the same way, automated decision making uh, is a pattern uh, that is replicated across the world with credit scores and uh, insurance calculations, with the how welfare state is evolving. Um, emulating a model that has been mostly developed in the, in the United States. Now we're in a more complicated landscape where China is competing with that influence and with that model, um, competing um, through attraction with 
new opportunities for businesses, uh, e-commerce being one of uh, the main avenues for that uh, effort to, to promote a competing model. Also, uh, with some efforts to propose uh, better control for the states over their, their societies in some authoritarian countries across the world. We are seeing uh, companies like Hague Vision, Huawei, SenseTime sell products that are incorporated with certain visions of how good governance is conducted. Of course, it's been also mentioned uh, how China is now competing with uh, on the, the strategic side uh, with uh, the notion of intelligent warfare and developing it there. Uh, the military with uh, AI. Uh, we're also seeing that competition happen at the standards level um, with more Chinese actors uh, being present in international standards setting organizations like uh, the IETF, W3C. I used to spend time looking at domain name systems when that was still one of the geopolitical priorities. And I saw how more Chinese actors, corporate, uh, academic and official actors would populate um, those uh, th those platforms to um, push for standards that were more in favor on, of Chinese interests. Of course, that constitutes um, a challenge and a change of the landscape uh, with which um, everybody, not just the United States, but everybody in the world needs um, to uh, need to deal with. Um, you rightly reminded us of how much that industry is globalized and uh, and that was a great point that you made um because i i, I forgot to include that uh, but it's very uh, important thing as we are seeing that china us competition unfold that this has ripple effects um on a range of actors in asia uh, japan south korea in europe and how uh, this is forcing all of these actors to reevaluate how they are positioning uh, with that competition for europe um there's a range of issues uh, that are raised uh, with that landscape, and this is really vast, and I can only go very fast on each of uh, on each one. Of course, there are ethical and legal issues in uh, the international collaboration, scientific, commercial. Um, for example, uh, a lot of scientific projects have Chinese partners and often uh, it used to be that uh, the role of the Chinese partner was to provide the data sets that could difficultly be collected in Europe or even the US because of our more strict regulations. Um, but then it raises a, an issue uh, of how, can you actually benefit from uh, data collection that has been made in a more uh, relaxed uh, legal context uh, with uh, little constraints as to the consent of the people whose data we're using, for example. And this is happening in fields as sensitive um, as uh, genomics, uh, for instance, uh, even as we know that uh, in China, some actors have an agenda of ethnic discrimination and surveillance. And so there, there are a number, and this is just one example, um, right? So there's a number of, of fields uh, where there are real uh, deep uh, ethical issues. Um, in Europe, we tend to uh, see the regulation of AI, the regulation of uh, personal data, um, of the, this digital field in general as a hurdle to the development of our companies. Um, Indeed, um, the, the approach has been quite different from uh, the move fast and break things that we have seen in, in the US, for instance, where uh, there was a more relaxed approach to let innovation happen, to let companies grow and then see uh, uh, what we can do about it. However, um, we could also look at it the other way and try to promote a, a relationship where European regulation, which is strengthening at the moment, can be see, seen as a, a safe haven in the future for uh, with better cybersecurity um, and where citizens and corporate data will be better protected. We can also look at um, how um, data collection and processing could be uh, a source of vulnerability 
we have a lot of examples of hacking, uh, data theft, and then uh, there's quite a number of scenarios of uh, potential data poisoning, um, biases in uh, the uh, the data used in algorithms, uh, all sorts of um, of ways in which the use of AI in critical sectors could actually generate uh, fields uh, where we are becoming uh, more vulnerable, including uh, the procurement of the resources needed to actually build those systems. Uh, from energy to raw materials and uh, to um, uh, even the, the human resources that are needed. This competition is also putting us in a, um, in a situation where the time frame that we have to think about all these challenges is reduced because of the urgency that is perceived around, um, the, uh, around the, that uh, competition. This deprives us of the time that we need for a proper democratic public debate about what type of, of technology we want and under what kind of uh, conditions, legal, ethical framework, um, and so on. Uh, we are seeing progress, um, but the progress is a little bit too slow considering how fast technology and uses are going. And yet, uh, I believe we need a positive agenda for AI, not just a reactive one, considering these uh, challenges. Some of my colleagues uh, in the academic world are uh, advocating now for the digital that we want. With the, they use the hashtag uh, le numérique que nous voulons uh, in all of their work. And I find that a quite interesting field of research to try and defend a positive agenda. For that, we need certainly a more critical inquiry to uh, reframe, uh, refrain from technological solutionism. In certain fields, there are low-tech solutions that might um, uh, actually be able to answer some of our problems, and all the more so for some of our partners in the developing world. Uh, we also need to think harder about how to make digital technology more sustainable in terms of energy consumption, the environment. We know that AI requires a lot of computing power, which also implies uh, extracting lots of resources. And unfortunately, that aspect too often is relegated at the very end of uh, talks and in the footnotes of our articles. And that should come first. And for that, we need to develop more critical expertise that's independent from government or the industry, and uh, with uh, more input from uh, expertise uh, from a lot of different fields like urban planning, sustainable development, social sciences, and so on. Um, just so that it doesn't distract us uh, from the other systemic challenges that we are facing, uh, which are not always a matter of technology per se, uh, like climate warning, biodiversity, inequalities, the pandemics, and you name it. I'll stop uh, here for the moment, and uh, we can come back uh, in the Q&A session. Thank you. Um, yes, perfect. Sorry, I just um, see that time flies, and I want to let some room for, for questions. Um, maybe while um, you you can prepare a question and, and ask them in the Q&A session for people online, um, I'll give Gregory an opportunity to maybe come back on some of the points briefly. Um, and also, I'd like to throw in the first question of the day um, on, on the, the impact that you see of this international competition on, on the American and Chinese views on how to uh, regulate, create standards, create uh, get standards that you mentioned, or guidelines, um, both internally, domestically, and internationally uh, for for AI in the future. Um, Gregory, back to you. Sure. Well, thank you, and thanks to the other speakers for those terrific presentations. I think the um, the things that struck me immediately, you know, uh, about the comments were about the extent of collaboration between. Um, Europe and China and the United States and China in the AI research ecosystem. Um, this is indeed true. If you go to uh, NeurIPS or uh, you know, CVPR or just any of the, the largest, most prestigious AI research conferences, um, you will find uh, companies like iFlyTech, uh, you know, companies like Hikvision, 
companies like SenseTime. And if quality is the only metric that determines whether a company belongs at these research conferences, those Chinese companies belong. Uh, their research is exceptionally high quality. I think the challenge you know, for the United States and for Europe as it's wrestling with these issues is that the financial basis of these companies is basically uh, the Chinese surveillance and censorship state. Um, that is the that is the bulk of iFlytex revenue. That is the bulk of Sense Times revenue. That is why they are profitable companies. That is why they are so good at scaling massive AI systems because they learned how to scale the massive Chinese, you know, surveillance uh, state. Um, the second thing I would say is, you know, what is what is the nature of that uh, research collaboration in terms of the sort of um, respective benefits that accrue? Um, I think one challenge for you know, Europe is that when it produces high quality AI research um, in collaboration you know, with China or with the United States, um, the financial return on investment might principally accrue you know, to, to China, because they actually have a pathway to commercializing that research that is more expeditious. Um, so that is a challenge. The second thing I would say is around, you know, standards and regulations. Um, one thing that is, you know, just always important to recall in the Chinese, you know, context is that th those regulations are real. Um, they really do affect the behavior of Chinese companies, um, but they do not affect the behavior of the Chinese military or the Chinese uh, domestic population control agencies. They are exempt from any and all um, of these regulations. And so um, I, I often find myself frustrated, you know, because you will hear um, here, in, here in Washington, D.C. even, um, uh, in individuals in the scholarly community or in the political community, you know, talking about China's, you know, success at AI regulations that protect privacy. Um, but those are protections from uh, corporate invasions of privacy. There is no protection whatsoever, right, from uh, the, the government's uh, invasion of privacy. And then finally, I would say, you know, what is... Um, the policy that is under underpinning, you know, China's approach to uh, industrial advancement in AI and semiconductor technology in particular, um, I think, it, you know, one thing that was really remarkable to me in my most recent paper, um, you know, I was scrubbing a lot of Chinese policy documents and leadership speeches um, and industry association reports, and I think perhaps one of the most remarkable findings was the continued life. Uh, and influence of Made in China 2025. Uh, so for those of you who are, who are not familiar with this policy, China announced it in, uh, I believe it was 2014, and it came out sort of with finality in 2015. And it announced, you know, sector by sector targets for uh, Chinese company market share. Um, so for example, in semiconductors, you know, it said that it wanted Chinese companies to have 70% global market share and 70% local market share in semiconductors. Well, in practice, what that means is that all these, you know, US or European or Japanese or Korean companies who have invested a lot of money uh, in building factories in China, uh, you know, China's government was sort of stating the long term plan is pushing those those firms and those investments to the side. Um, and making it taking advantage of the sort of technology transfer that is taking place, um, but ultimately ensuring you know that it is Chinese-owned companies that went out. So there was a massive backlash to China, uh, made in China 2025 when it occurred. Um, there was some uh, so, for example, in, in U.S. domestic politics, the the Chamber of Commerce had been one of the principal defenders of China in U.S. Uh, domestic politics for for decades. And the Chamber of Commerce issued a scathingly negative report on Made in China 2025. Uh, the European Chamber of Commerce did the same thing um, because they, they viewed that approach to industrial development 
um, as unfair and exploitative. Um, so China sort of publicly renounced this policy and said, oh, that, that was a, we wrote it accidentally, that's not our real policy. But if you go to the national AI development strategy, um, which Rebecca mentioned in her remarks, um, that Chinese strategic plan, Tsinghua University in China did a review of the uh, policies that were cited uh, in the documents for the local government AI strategies. Um, and this report, which came out you know, in 2018, many years after China had publicly renounced Made in China 2025, well, the most cited policy in implementing the AI strategy was Made in China 2025. And that was in 2018. Um, in 2019, uh, senior Chinese officials were still being fired uh, for criticizing Made in China 2025. And so I think that's that's the challenge here. Thank you. Um, so, sorry, I just wanted to have the opportunity to open the, the questions to, to the room. Um, so for people online, you can ask them in the, in the Q&A section, uh, but we're going to start with some question in the room. Um, please uh, uh, start by state, stating your name and affiliation. Um, you can ask your questions in English or French. And also please, um, as time is limited, uh, we'd like to keep them very brief. So um, I know it's tempting, but no lengthy anecdote on ChatGPT. <laughs> I will show no mercy. Uh, we'll start maybe uh, at the back and then uh, we'll take John's question. Good afternoon. Um, good afternoon. Uh, it's Mark Scott here from Politico. Uh, Rebecca, to you, could you give a bit more color and um, detail on the relationship between European and Chinese researchers, particularly regarding military applications of AI technology, I think found that was particularly interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Um, John, maybe just a few seconds for the mic to get to you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thanks to all three of you for the uh, the fascinating uh, presentations. And I think I'm going to jump to Mathilde's uh, favorite topic, which is export controls. Um, just to ask what you think uh, the impact of China's most recent uh, uh, reaction to uh, to those export controls might be, in specifically in terms of uh, their announcement to eventually limit uh, access to uh, gallium and germanium, uh, what that would ultimately do to our ability or, or you know, the world's ability, I guess, to produce uh, high quality semiconductors, uh, is that going to impact the entire industry globally? Uh, is that something that is actually not gonna have much of an effect because we can react quickly? Um, and if you have any other reflections on what other responses we might expect uh, from China, I think Rebecca, you've already talked about some of those, but if you, if you have anything that you've you've left out, I'm certainly interested to, to see how you, you see China's reaction. Thank you. Um, thank you. If we don't have any other question from the room, um, I'm going to take a, a question from, from uh, Jean-Yves Larguet uh, online from Iris. Um, he asks, how about public opinions? Which societies are much more open to a broad de deployment of AI in their life, security, work efficiency, medical, etc.? And uh, would it make a difference in the AI race? Um, maybe we could start with you, Rebecca. <laughs> Thank you. Um, great questions, um, both um, questions from the room. Um, on um, a military relevant um, research collaboration in AI with China, I mean, definitely um, in AI, um, just as in other um, tech and scientific disciplines, we are seeing, I think, entanglements between the European and, and the Chinese AI ecosystem, which um, in my view, are, are quite problematic from a uh, national security perspective. Um, and I think we're also seeing um, entanglements which are quite problematic from, a, from an ethical and from a human rights uh, perspective. Um, and we can get to the weeds, into the weeds of um, export controls and what they cover and what they don't. But in, in general, most of what I'm, I'm looking at, most of those papers, um, that um, you know, European and, and Chinese colleagues are, are co-authoring maybe on on, on applying um, AI for for target tracking, so for 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 striking, uh, for for better strikes in a uh, in the context of a military operation. Most of those papers they wouldn't be, uh, you know, illegal um, because that is uh, basic research and because. 
um, of the existing exemptions uh, for, for, for fundamental research, which you find um, in um, most export controls regimes and in, in the EU um, um, regulation as well. Um, but at the same time, I would argue, I mean, that doesn't make those collaborations um, right or in line with European um, uh, public interests just because uh, they are legal. Um, so we, we are seeing a number of those. And I think the question here, um, um, as you know, the, the European Commission is, is trying to come up with a categorization of, of critical technologies as part of the proposed uh, economic security strategy. I think the challenge there is to be um, as granular as possible. Um, looking at both the partner in China, uh, which lab it is that we're talking about, and, and which research is being pursued. Uh, because if we cast the net too wide, I think we run the risks of saying, you know, all AI collaboration with China is is high risk. And I would I would caution against you know policy. Um, policy responses that go in that direction, because as I mentioned, there's a great deal of, of beneficial collaboration that's that's being pursued. Um, oh, the, um, yes, the uh, Chinese response. Um, Gregory, maybe you wanted to also uh, chime in on this one, then I can, I can say a few words. Um, you can say a few so, words and maybe okay. then uh, we'll let yeah. Gregory jump. I'm sorry, so I didn't hear I was, you. Which topic are you asking me to chime in on? The um, um, Chinese um, reaction to um, American export controls. Oh, certainly. So um, I think the the remarkable thing is how little you know China's strategy for uh, the semiconductor industry in particular has changed in response to the export controls. And uh, the the metaphor that I heard recently you know, from a US government official was that even before October 7th, um, when it comes to sort of uh, replacing foreign companies with Chinese companies on a scale of one to 10, you know, China was already an 11. You know, they were already investing hundreds of billions of dollars into this industry, into this category um, with the explicit goal of self-reliance uh, in this technology. So I actually don't think that the, the policy has made a meaningful difference in China's desire you know, to eliminate its dependence upon uh, foreign technology. Um, I do think that the policy has made a meaningful difference in China's ability to end its reliance on foreign technology, uh, which I can go into. And then there have been sort of three major retaliatory measures um, there has been the elimination of Micron as a memory supplier to China. Uh, memory is um, a market dominated by three firms, one American, two South Korean. Um, and the American firm Micron is now banned uh, effectively from the, the Chinese market. Then uh, China's antitrust authorities have effectively blocked all mergers uh, between any American semiconductor company and really any other company worldwide. And then finally is the one that uh, just came out recently um, with relation to uh, rare earth metals related to semiconductor production. Um, I just want to point out that that rare earth uh, move is not the first time China has done this. They did this to Japan uh, more than 10 years ago. Um, at the time, it was you know, a different diplomatic dispute between China and Japan, but um, it's actually explicit uh, in a Xi Jinping speech that their goal is to increase other countries' dependence upon China uh, for the purpose of exploiting that as economic coercion. Um, so I don't think that their um, responses are likely to be effective, uh, co comparably effective as the October 7th export controls, uh, but they certainly are troubling and problematic. Um, thank you. Unless, Seven, you want to jump in, maybe we can take another round of questions. Oh, yeah. Um, so, yeah, there's the question about uh, are some public opinions more open to, to innovation and more ready to accept uh, the kind of disruption? I, I guess that's the, the meaning of the question. Um, there, are, there, there are 
differences in the socialization of different populations to uh, new technology and, and, and the appropriation and, and so on. But um, if we take the case of China, um, the the fact that um, it's, it used to be under-regulated uh, opened the space for some companies to collect a lot of data and develop uh, cutting edge um, algorithms um, based on uh, trained on that uh, data. But at the same time, uh, also it's a space where there's less room for expressing discontent. Um, so uh, there's also that factor, which uh, was influential for a long time. But at the same time, uh, there have been quite a lot of issues with cyber criminality, which affected directly large swaths of the population. And people would complain uh, quite a lot about phone calls that, that they received where people mentioned very private items about their lives and that kind of things. Um, there's the question of teenager dependency on social media and that kind of things, which are real social concerns. And those actually were uh, becoming so important um, that this was one of the major uh, motivations for the government to actually take action and regulate. So not regulate government access to personal data, but at least regulate in that commercial space. Um, so that nuances a bit the idea that this is a society that is ready to accept any and all uh, kinds of innovation. There is demand for regulation and for better protection of the population. And to a certain extent, limited extent, uh, but uh, still uh, the authorities uh, are ready to answer that because they're concerned about social stability. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. And in, in the um, sort of uh, same line uh, of, of this um, uh, uh, social concerns, um, we have a question online um, that was asked in French and that I will read in French if it's fine. Uh, plusieurs chercheurs experts en intelligence artificielle aux États-Unis appellent depuis plus d'un an à une pause dans le développement de l'intelligence artificielle, notamment le temps d'avoir une vision plus claire euh, euh, Y, y compris sur les, les préoccupations euh, éthiques et sociales euh, qu'on qu évoquait, euh, sur la sécurisation, l'alignement des, des futures intelligences artificielles et la nécessité d'éviter euh, une catastrophe. Est-ce qu'une telle pause peut être mise en place de manière réaliste, euh, étant donné la, la course entre euh, les États-Unis et la Chine euh, Voilà, c'est une, une première question. Euh, je vais en poser une, une deuxième en ligne avant d'en... Oh, yeah, and I'm maybe going to briefly translate uh, for, for Gregory and for the, the English speaking audience. Um, how realistic is it um, uh, to adopt the moratorium or the pause that was asked by several um, AI experts, especially in the US, in order to uh, avoid um, a potential catastrophe? Uh, how realistic is it regarding um, uh, the, I mean, considering the, the US China competition in, in this realm? Um, I also have an, another question from um, an online uh, um, um, auditor. How safe are models based on machine learning from, I quote, adversarial data environments, um, such as a mal malicious actor purposely inputting malicious data sets um, used for the training of machine learning systems to modify the intended behavior of trained systems? Um, is there such an incentive to do so, um, to do such actions for malicious actors? And could it be a, a key cybersecurity issue or is it just a, just a marginal issue? Um, maybe we could take a third last question online if there is. Otherwise, I'll gladly uh, pass the floor um, to the expert that would like to jump in. <laughs> Any success? Maybe regarding the... <laughs> Still thinking which which question <laughs> um, uh, I should write uh, because I think if I understood correctly the first one was referring mostly to uh, the U.S.'s vision. Um, well, it's, it's or if you could maybe more uh, from a more international perspective, like how realistic is, is it to call for a moratorium on on the development of AI that's going very fast, mm -hmm. considering that there's such a such a desire from uh, not only the U.S. and China to outrun one another. Well, I, I can speak to um, the reflection on this on this issue and, and on generative um, 
models in particular, um, maybe in the Chinese context. Um, and I think that reflection to some degree um, can be applicable um, to other jurisdictions as well, where um, there are um, a lot of concerns about how um, these models have the potential to um, mobilize um, public opinion. Um, obviously, uh, I'm talking about the Chinese context where the Chinese Communist Party is very much concerned about um, shaping the information environment and censoring dissenting voices. So, of course, they will be more, um, you know, um, more eager to regulate um, generated um, content. Uh, that said, um, I think it, it is an interesting argument um, there for like why maybe a, a generative model before being launched, before being released, should undergo a certain um, security or, or ethical review. Um, th that's what at least the draft um, Chinese regulations have mm -hmm. proposed. Now, obviously, we need to keep in mind that the models there would undertake review with the Cyberspace Administration of China, um, which is uh, primarily tasked uh, traditionally as a regulatory body with, with censoring the information space. So obviously, they do have a, a, a pretty clear uh, mandate. But at the same time, there are provisions in there, for example, concerning uh, the accuracy um, or the lack of bias in, in training data or uh, making sure that um, you know training data doesn't contain any uh, personally identifiable information which was, was collected um, without users uh, without people's consent. Uh, so I think these are some ideas which I'm mm. sure uh, regulators around the world uh, are um, are thinking about. Yeah, and maybe to briefly jump in on the on the US perspective, even though um, we have Gregor here that could talk better on, on this, um, I think it's quite unrealistic to think about a moratorium per se, as we see that even the um, the general initiatives and frameworks that have been uh, um, put forward in in the US that focus uh, on safety and then the necessity to better regulate and address the social concerns and potential catastrophe, um, they have reached very high level of uh, uh, political attention but they're still framed in the way um, of, um, of uh, preserving innovation and uh, allowing the US to run faster, et cetera. And that's even obvious in the title, for instance, of the uh, framework that was uh, announced at CSIS by um, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, which is called, I think, uh, Senate uh, Safe Innovation um, Act or something of the kind. So we have the two words there, but innovation is definitely there. Um, and unfortunately, uh, yeah, yes, maybe just one last word from Gregory very briefly, because otherwise, um, time out. <laughs> well, this is an odd note to end on, perhaps, but there is uh, no hope whatsoever for a moratorium. Um, it has attracted no interest from any of the major AI companies, and it has attracted no interest from many of the relevant governments. Uh, so a moratorium will not happen. Um, what I do think will happen is uh, some degree of regulation uh, in this field. Um, and already, you know, the, the major companies uh, that are leading the uh, research in this area and the commercial adoption of this area um, are openly calling for regulation, which was certainly not the case in the early days, for example, of the Internet. Um, so I do think that uh, some degree of regulation is ultimately going to take place. but. Um, yeah, I would I would say the the prospects for AI, you know, slowing down um, voluntarily or involuntarily, um, it's simply not going to happen. Uh, I, I could imagine. Uh, sorry, just let me say one final thing. I could imagine um, that we would have, you know, uh, an AI bubble uh, analogous to the Internet dot com bubble of the you know late 90s, early 2000s. Um, but the internet, you know, was not defeated by that bubble. Um, and I don't think anything is going to stop the, the rapid progress of AI. Thank you. Not, not very optimistic, but nevertheless, the perfect transition uh, to the, the second panel. But before this, rest assured, um, there is coffee and uh, um, I think some snacks for uh, those that want to stay for after. Thank you. Thank you.